am să introduc următorul invitat. Uh, Permiteți-mi să switch to English, ok? So, our first special guest is a renowned international expert in marketing strategy and a highly appreciated speaker at worldwide marketing conferences. She is the co-author of the book called Conversion Optimization, which is a bestseller on Amazon.com. So, for the first time in Moldova, let's welcome Ayat Shukhari. In your applause. Thank you, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. So yes, it is my first time in Moldova, and actually, a lot of times people would ask me, "Where are you going?" And I'm going, "I'm going to Moldova." They're like, "Oh, that was it's a little bit surprising," but I'm very excited. And actually, just the little that I understood and heard from the panel. It sounds like you guys are at a very interesting point in the e-commerce industry here in Moldova. This is an exciting point because there's so much potential and growth. So I see what you guys have right now is a situation that there's, it can only grow up or upwards from here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what you can test right away on your website. But let's think about just average conversion rates. This is one of the first questions we get as CRO experts at my company is, well, what's the average conversion rate? Because every company wants to beat that average conversion rate. So, you know, I guess I can ask the, the audience here, what do you guys think the average conversion rate is? Does anybody have an idea of what the average conversion rate is? Well, And, and the last slide kind of shows you, a lot of times people are thinking about what's the average and they're shooting and they're not necessarily knowing exactly what that is. The reality is average conversion rate can vary dramatically from one vertical, one industry to the next. So we always tell, and I thought the Cornell when he posted the blue strategy uh, quote about competing against yourself rather than competing against your, com your competitors is super important to think about, right? You want to try to think about where do I want to be? Look, your competitors can be here and they're, gonna get it, they're trying to make it here. You're at a different level. And that's the way you want to think about it when you're thinking about conversion rates as well. So as you can see here, from month to month, a desktop conversion rate can vary. So what does that average conversion rate really mean? Similar to, of course, mobile. Again, if you're going to look at conversion rates from your, your perspective and when you're looking at your data, make sure you're at least segmenting by device. Super important. I know that you guys already have talks today about GA4. Super important to make sure that you guys are up to date with that. But you want to also look at conversion rates per device. Um, but you can see, from month to month, it's varying so dramatically. So do I really want to always try to achieve the average conversion rate, or am I always trying to improve my overall revenue? So in the U.S., although, you know, again, the U.S. is kind of seen as a beacon, um, we have something called Cyber Monday. So this comes right after the Black Friday, the big sales. Cyber Monday comes. In 2016, we were able to produce 3.4 billion as from Cyber Monday. And that increased by 2021 to 10.7 billion. So there's an amazing amount of growth, 51% amount growth from 2016 to 2021. Now, if I compare that to China's Singles Day, China's Singles Day, they started out in 2016, 17.8 billion. 93% growth by 2021 at 139 billion. That's an amazing jump. But the difference between China and the US is that they're much more advanced when it comes to mobile optimization. When they're thinking about you know, increasing conversion rates, when they're thinking about optimization in general, they're really thinking about that huge, you know, like mobile first. Everybody's using their mobile device. Now, I don't have the stats for Moldova, but I would assume that it's a similar trend throughout Europe that people are typically shopping online with their phones. 
So you want to make sure that whenever you're doing any type of changes on your website, you're looking at mobile first. That should be the first way to go and ensure that that experience is very optimized. The other thing to consider when it's, we're thinking about conversion rates in general is that we're always thinking about the big yes, the purchase, right? But you and I know conversion rate doesn't happen in one step. It takes several different steps. I need to be convincing the visitor throughout their experience to say yes. They look at the ad, I need to make sure my ad copy is up to par in order for them to say yes, this is exactly what I need, this is what I'm going to click into and I'm going to actually move forward. From looking at the ad, what do I see? I might go directly to a product page or a landing page. I need to make sure that I have the right information there. I need to get that. Yes, this makes sense. This is the product that I need. This is the description that makes sense for me. Then, of course, from there, they go on to the cart page. Again, I need to make sure. What am I providing them? What information am I giving them in order to give them the level of uh, persuasiveness that's going to move them forward throughout the funnel. Finally, of course, this is where the key, you know, uh, information that's very important and near and dear to their heart, they're going to enter their financial information. You want to make sure you've given them all the reasons to trust that you are some, a company that's going to provide them with the right product, you're going to deliver it on time, you have great policies in order for them to be able to say yes and enter in their information. So again, the conversion doesn't happen in one step. We're always looking at that overall average conversion rate, but I really need to see what is the conversion rate throughout my funnel? Okay, what's my conversion rate from my ads to the landing page, from the landing page to the uh, cart page? Those are the conversion rates that really matter, and that's what I want to be increasing throughout my experience. I don't want to only focus on the orders. I want to focus on the mini yeses throughout the funnel in order for me to ensure that I'm going to get a better overall experience. Now, of course, we all know that visitors are not coming from one source. You have visitors that are coming through you know, search ads. You have visitors that are coming directly to you. They know your brand a little bit more. Every single one of those visitors has a different journey and a different story. How am I going to persuade them in the right way and convince them that this is exactly what they need? That they've gotten to the right place and I'm going to move them forward through the funnel. So I need to keep in mind all of those different experiences that are coming to the site. And remember, it's Yes, about that big yes, but I have to think about what is happening throughout. They had to agree to several different steps before they made that big yes. That's the way that I'm going to be really enhancing their overall experience, right? So one of the first things that we tell any customer that comes to us is we need to first make sure, of course, that the UX makes sense on your site. Am I directing the visitor in the right way? Have I upheld basic UX principles on the site. If I have, then I'll be able to get them through this funnel a lot faster. And when we look at this, we're also looking at those no's, right? I want to see, when I'm evaluating a website, I'm looking at their analytics and I'm looking at their funnel, I'm looking at their heat maps, I'm looking at their session recording, all of those data points are telling me a story. They're telling me also why are people saying no? What is the reason that they're objecting to move forward throughout the funnel? What's happening to them throughout their experience that they might say, no, this doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to move forward to the product page. Something is broken throughout the experience for them. So I need to figure out exactly what's happening. And again, there are several different ways. We follow a methodology called the SHIP method. And SHIP, it's a really easy thing to remember, but it stands for scrutinize, hypothesize, implement, and propagate. So I need to first scrutinize, which means I need to research. I need to understand what is happening with my visitors. Why are they not moving? Why are they saying no? So again, first and foremost, if you're going to be tracking conversions overall and all those different mini yeses and nos throughout the funnel, you want to look at the conversion rate at every single point throughout your funnel. 
Now, I, a lot of times I'll give suggestions to my clients and they'll tell me, you know, we should just implement this. Let's just move forward. It makes sense. It's logical. Everything that we propose to our clients is very logical, right? But I tell them no. Because even if it's a logical solution, it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to work. And it's happened several times. So whenever I'm going to implement anything, I need to A-B test it. I need to make sure that it really is the right solution. I may have identified a problem. I have a hypothesis. Those might be correct. But maybe the way that I implemented the solution simply didn't resonate with the visitor. So I want to make sure whatever solution I do put forth for my visitor, it makes sense. And the only way I can validate that is through A-B testing. So I highly, highly recommend, even if you feel like the solution is very logical, that before you implement it on your website, you make sure that you A-B test it. And again, if you're, just say you have a website, you guys don't have a lot of conversions. A lot of, thing, a lot of times for sites that don't have a lot of conversions, what we do is we do something called micro-testing. Rather than measuring the final yes, the order, I'm measuring how many visitors actually flowed based on my solution from this page to the next page, from product page to cart page, from collection page to product page. And that way I can still do testing because there's more visitors that are flowing in that way and I can measure, did I increase the conversion rate for that particular page? Because that's what I want to accomplish. Okay, so now we're getting into the good stuff, the case studies. What are some A-B tests that you can take away today and implement on your own websites? Now again, remember what we said about the competitors. It's very important not to just copy your competitors. There's a tendency for a lot of you know, sites to look at what the competitors are doing and just copy them. What works for them and for their visitors doesn't necessarily work for yours. So again, that's why you want to measure it. That's why you want to make sure that the solution makes sense. That's, one, that's why you want to make sure that you've identified the right problem before actually implementing that solution. So eBay, again, this is not a case study that we've done. We did work with eBay, but that, not in this uh, capacity. This is their app throughout the years. They started very early on in the 2000s. And when they first started and they released their app, this is what it looked like. This is the screen that you would see when you actually entered. And it's very fascinating to see that over the past many years, this app has transformed altogether. And what, did, what motivated them, for example, to, to place the barcode next to the search, right? So again, this is pieces of data that's coming into them that's telling them that visitors are utilizing this and this is easier for them. But then literally a year later, they changed it, they put a red line through it, they tried to attract visitors to it a little bit more, they changed the way that their menu appeared. Again, they're not making these changes, they have a huge team. They're not making these changes just randomly. They're looking at data points, they're seeing where are the visitors more likely to go, where are they clicking on, they're looking at heat map data, they're looking at analytics and they're analyzing what's happening on this page and how am I going to address the needs of the visitors even better. It changed so much after that. They added a little bit more to really direct the visitors to where they need to go. And that's the key thing is you always wanna to try to remember, where do I wanna direct them? Where do I wanna make sure that they go? How do I present them with the right pieces of information? The challenging thing that we all have is that we have visitors with different motivations. So one of the key things is first you need to understand what are those different motivations, right? And then based on that, you need to be able to prioritize what are those elements that I'm going to place on the page that make a lot of sense for them. Again, the app continues to change over the years, as you guys can see. It's very interesting to see how the search changes. They try to de-emphasize it at some point, like in this particular case, and then they go back and the search is actually um, more prominent than it was before. And again, the reason why they do this is they found probably through their data that when they made it de-emphasized, visitors were less likely to use it. And when they were less likely to use it, they saw a decrease in their overall conversion rates and that's not what they wanna achieve. So again, throughout the years, this is changing over and over again. 
This is 10 years of eBay app design and it continues obviously to be, uh, to change and to uh, um, uh, be optimized. And that's the key thing. I, I, the, the thing is, is that you're never gonna get to a point where your site is just good the way it is. There's always opportunity to change it and to improve it. Your visitors, just like you as a company, are maturing and changing. Your visitors are maturing and changing. So to think that you can create a site that's just going to stay the same way for many years, it's just absolutely not possible. So this is one of our clients. They sell online, uh, they sell furniture online. And uh, one thing that we noticed is that when the visitors would go to the site, they were more likely to convert if they actually utilized the search. So search was a very big component for them. We also saw that a lot of visitors, for example, returning visitors had accounts. And the account, um, and accessing the account was very difficult for them on the site. So how are we going to actually change this for them? So again, these are data points that we were uncovering. Based on these data points, we said, we see that there are a lot of visitors that are utilizing the menu. So how do we make sure that the menu, since we see there's a lot of clicks on the menu, how do we make sure that they have search accessible there as well as the login information? So we created this design where we place the login information. There's also a location indicator because they have several uh, stores. So a visitor can actually click to see if the store is nearby them. Um, and then we added, of course, the search. The other key thing that we changed on the design was that if you notice, in order to expand, there's a little plus next to each category. We changed it to an arrow to make it a little bit easier for them to visualize. Um, and you know, that indicator is a lot easier for them to actually move forward with. This was actually able to produce for them a 4.71% increase in their conversion rate. Now again, when we measured this one, this one is overall, but typically when we're launching any type of an A-B test, we are looking at several different uh, metrics. We're not looking at only the overall. We're looking at how many visitors are actually flowing to category pages and product pages uh, as a result of this particular design. The next one, price on PDP. Right when the visitor arrived to the site, they saw the price. That was the first thing that they saw. It was above the product image. This is for a clothing website called Soft Surroundings. So again, what we noticed was, the data that we kind of relied on was we saw that first of all, heat map data, visitors were not scrolling very deep on the page. They were not even getting to the add to cart. Second thing that we saw was that visitors were bouncing off of product pages. The bounce rate on the product pages was very high and the exit rate on product pages was very high. So you take those two data points and you say, well, there's something that's stopping them right when they get to this page. What is it? The price could be a little bit of a sticker shocker and this dress is, it's a dress I think, or a caftan. It's like $200, so it's not cheap. Um, so there might be a little bit of a price shock there. I wanna make sure that I convince them and persuade them about my product before I shock them with the price. I can shock them after they are very sold on how beautiful it is. They look at my product images and then I can show them the price. So we move the price below, as you can, can see in the second image, right above the add to cart. And that actually increased their conversion rate by 5.07%. The next key thing was one of the things that we do is we have conversations with customers. We actually talk to them on the phone to understand a little bit more about what, why did they choose this particular site, this particular product, and what is the objective of, of uh, their purchase? Like, why did they purchase this item? One thing that I always believe is there's no such thing as an impulse pur purchase. You might be telling me, no, actually, like there are impulse purchases. I just bought like a beautiful pair of shoes or I bought, you know, this like new sports uh, item and it was an impulse purchase. But the reality is that if you really think about it, you've thought about the item before. You've thought about it or maybe something happened with you in your life that you felt like I deserve to treat myself. And that's why you decided to actually purchase something. So I believe there's no such thing as an impulse purchase. Um, so when we talk to these customers, a lot of them mentioned that one of the things that convinced them to purchase the item 
was the fact that there was a QA section on the page and they were able to re read this information and then move forward with the purchase. So we told our client, well, this, this QA section is buried below the cross cells. A lot of visitors aren't even getting to it. If it's so important and it's persuaded so many visitors, why are we burying this information on the page? Again, how can we extract this information? If we didn't talk to the customers, we wouldn't have known this very important piece of information. So we moved the QA section above, and we were able to increase their conversion rates by 7.15%. So again, every single experiment that we launched was based in some sort of a data point that we were able to extract from amazing, awesome, uh, different ways of, of collecting data. We're so lucky that we can understand so much more about the visitor, uh, but also customer interviews. Just getting on the phone with them and talking to them, you'll be able to extract so much really great information. Um, this next uh, piece, again, a lot of our, we rely heavily on what we call, of course, heuristics, right? You might be familiar with them. There are 10 different heuristics. You wanna make sure that you're addressing them, right? And one of the key ones is ease of use. How do I make sure that it's easy for visitors to navigate on my website? One thing that we notice is a lot of times for, this is the soft surroundings website, the clothing website. A lot of times you'll, they'll have cross sells on the page, but they have to be navigated to a different product page in order to add that item. That's a lot of clicks, that's a lot of work for your visitor. One thing that you wanna make sure is you don't wanna make them work very hard. The more they click, the more they work, the more they have to think, the less likely it is that they're going to move forward. How can I ease the process, make it very simple for them? Just with a very quick click, they can get to what they need. So I already have them on the product page. They look at the cross sell, they're convinced. Do I wanna really move them to another product page? No. What we did was we added something called a quick shop which again, from the same product page, they just get a window and they can add the item directly to uh, their cart without leaving the experience. So always think about that. You don't wanna let your visitors leave the experience that they're in because if they do, the likelihood of them returning is very, very uh, small. Um, and then again, sometimes just redesigning, realigning the elements can just make it look a lot uh, better and uh, can improve the overall experience. This one actually produced a 5.8% increase in conversion rate, as well as a significant increase in AOV, because ultimately that was our, multi our goal, right? We wanted to increase conversion rates, but I wanted to also increase the AOV. I wanted to get more visitors to add more products, right? And I wanted to make it very easy for them and seamless. Um, this is another search one. Search is big, again, depending on your stats. If you know that search actually helps with conversion rate, the one thing that you want to do is you want to make sure it's very prominent. In this particular case for this client, it was tucked away in the menu. The only way that you can access search was on the menu, as well as there's that little icon that you can uh, access it there. So what we did was, as upon arrival to the site, the search would be automatically expanded. The client didn't like this. They didn't like it because they thought it made their site, it wasn't as nice, you know, it didn't look as sexy as they usually like it to look. So they were not very happy with this design, but when they saw that it increased their conversion rates by 10.61%, they were fine with it. <laughs> so again, sometimes it's not necessarily the execution that you necessarily like. A lot of times our clients say, oh, it's off brand, it's not on brand. But again, we're trying to find those solutions that are going to persuade your visitors, that are going to help them, um, you know, and make things more accessible and easier for them to use. The last case study that I have for you guys today is, of course, you know, any type of incentive. This is one of our elements of the conversion framework is incentives. How do I incentivize the visitor to move forward? Many times on many sites, they'll say, hey, if you reach a certain threshold in your conversion rate, you'll be able to get free shipping. I don't know, maybe you guys have similar incentives here in Moldova, but it's very helpful. Um, but what they did was they actually wanted to increase their average order value as well, so they added uh, a particular gift with purchase. If you purchase this particular item for, even if it's a, for an amount, maybe it's a small amount, less than the actual value of the product, 
then you'll be able to get the, um, the free shipping threshold as well as this item. So that actually was a, an amazing experience for them and increased their conversion rate 7.94% as well as, of course, increasing the average order value. That was our ultimate goal. Again, sometimes our goals are aligned with increasing the conversion rate, but also looking at what is that average order value. If that's my goal, I want to increase the average order value, I have to make sure that my solutions are are, are doing that. And with all these different A-B testing tools that are out there, you can certainly get to that point where you can make sure that you're um, measuring the increase in average order value if that's what the objective is for your particular experiment. Um, and this is a bonus one. Um, for this particular site, it's skincare. And if you guys notice on the first design, they have the, uh, the price. It looks like it's almost like an add to cart button. But it wasn't. It was just the price of the product. So this is one of the first things that we noticed on their website, that the price looks like it's the actual CTA, which could be a little bit something that could cause a little bit of friction with the visitor. And we want to reduce that friction, friction as much as possible. So we removed the price from that you know, black border. And we ma made the add to cart actually that dark color to, again, emphasize and, and reduce friction as much as possible. And we were able to see a 17% increase in conversion rate. Now, this was a site-wide experiment because this particular um, design was on collection pages as well as the home page and several different points throughout the website. So it had a very, very, very big impact on their overall conversion rate. So the key thing about powerful A-B testing is that you want to make sure, first of all, that you, are, you have a high velocity of testing. You're always testing different things, right? And you make sure that, of course, it is backed in some sort of customer research. I don't want to just look at overall, you know, like I'm, I'm just randomly. I could probably put all of you guys together in a room, and we could come up with a million different ideas. But if they're not based in some sort of research and some sort of heuristic understanding and some sort of understanding of optimization overall, then I may be just saying something random, right, and not really coming up with the right solution. It's also based on, of course, segmenting. I want to segment my data. Depending on the amount of traffic that you have, segment it based on the source that they're coming from. Your Google Analytics and paid traffic is going to be very different than, for example, your organic or your social traffic. You want to make sure you do that segmentation. And like I said, the most basic segmentation that you do is, of course, by device, but it's super important that you always segment by device. You don't look like your overall conversion rates. You want to make sure that you understand what your conversion rates are, what that funnel looks like in each uh, uh, device type. And then, of course, any type of insights. The customer Bible, that's where I'm gathering all this information about the customer. I'm also, throughout my testing, as I experiment, as I launch different experiments, I'm actually able to understand a little bit more about the visitors. So every piece of, you know, every experiment that I run, every data uh, that I pull, that's all adding to my customer Bible, what I understand a lot more about my customer in order for me to create a better persuasive experiment for, for them. That's what I have for you today, all the way from Chicago, Illinois. Thank you very much. If you guys would like to reach out, please do. I'm very happy to be here, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Hayat. Thank you very much. We have a, a lot of questions for you, okay. so fortunately we have time to do that. Uh, let's see, you can see the questions in here or in here. Uh, we, we will try to pick some of them. Uh, one of them is, what technologies and digital marketing tools are considered the most effective for attracting the attention of a young audience? So what technologies and tools are considered better for a young audience? I mean, again, I think there are, if you're on social, that's definitely the place to be, right? If you want to make sure that you're attracting customers using TikTok and all these different social platforms, that'll be a way to really engage them a little bit more. But you want to make sure whatever you are doing is you do have a person that understands that market, right? So. You want somebody that is that age or similar to that age that can understand that market in order to make sure that you produce content and um, ads that really would resonate with that uh, particular age group. Um, 
How to treat A-B testing results in context of huge traffic loss due to GDPR? So the one thing that you want to know is, of course, the decrease in conversion rates is across all of the different variations, including the control. So it's an equal impact, correct? So you have JDPR, it's impacted the control, like your, the control that you're testing against, as well as the other variations. So I would, if, if the um, impact happened, for example, while you were testing, you might want to flush the data and rerun it. Um, or, you know, just rely on the fact that the experiment actually has already run through all the different variations and the impact is equal across all the variations, so you wouldn't have to necessarily worry about it polluting the data. Okay. I hope I addressed that question. Yes, thank okay. you very much. If I use sale triggers, what would be a better color for mm -hmm. them, red or green? Also, about the button says add to cart or buy now or see the product. Does yes. the color really affect the conversion rate? Yeah, one thing that we always say is that uh, conversion rate optimization is not about changing a CTA color, right? Yes. It's a lot deeper than that. Um, you know, now again, have we tested with different colors? Perhaps in some cases, for example, especially if our client is going through some sort of like a brand change, we might want to make sure and validate that, hey, if they do change all the different CTAs, is that going to impact the overall conversion rate? Um, but I don't believe that it's going to necessarily make a huge change. Right? Like it's not going to like be something that's going to impact. A lot of times we say red, for instance, means stop. So or that's just one or, thing to... Or something in, like that. Exactly. And green is go. So keep that in mind. I mean, again, it, it could, you could test with that element if you have the bandwidth. But at the same time, I always say that conversion rate optimization is definitely not about just switching colors. Of course. And, and also, I, had, um, I would like you to mention to them the fact that when you do A-B testing, you have to change just one thing because it's not multivariate testing, right? And why is that? Right. So one thing is that if I want to understand why this particular element had an impact, then I need to be testing that one thing. If I make many changes, I don't know what, what affected the visitor. What was the actual impact of the change that I made? So that's why we recommend, of course, that you just focus on one element. Your hypothesis is focused on one element. And that way, you can make sure that I measure it and I understand this particular change had this type of an impact on my visitor. And I could take that learning and also think about how am I going to propagate that learning throughout my site. Do you have any examples or tools that you use for optimizing conversion rates that you, that you can share with the audience? Well, like maybe Hotjar, does yeah. it help? Hotjar is excellent for session recordings and for heat maps. We use a tool called FigPi, um, that's F-I-G-P-I-I. -I. That one has also heat map session recordings as well as A-B testing. Hotjar doesn't include A-B testing. VWO is a very good A-B testing platform. It also includes some um, heat maps and session recordings. So I usually like the tools that are a little bit more comprehensive and they include everything so that you don't have to add also many scripts on your site because as you know, the more tools and scripts on your site, the slower your site is going to be. So in order to avoid that, I usually recommend that you have um, just one tool, for example, that does, does it all, as long as it's effective. Okay. Do you also use Google Optimize for A-B testing? It's a question from the audience. Well, so Google Optimize, as you know, is sunsetting, which means that it's no longer going to be available. So we have used it in the past, but I believe in September? Yes. September, it is no longer going to be available. So. If you're using Google Optimize, you definitely need to find an alternative. And again, I did share my information, so if you guys want to reach out to me, I can make some recommendations for you. Excellent. Uh, another question, but um, the question is, what are your top five most impactful tips? But I would say at least one. What is the most, well, the most impactful tip uh, for an online shop that is already pretty well optimized? So um, I would definitely recommend customer interviews. Um, we utilize a specific methodology called jobs to be done theory. Uh, so whenever we interview, we interview with that in mind and we use that particular script. And it really helps with the providing more insights and information about what, is, what are the visitors thinking? Why did they select my brand versus any other brand? So I would highly recommend that. I'm going to add one more, is do a walkthrough of your site periodically. 
Um, so many times, one of the first things that we do with our clients is we get on a call with them and we do a walkthrough from their ads to their landing pages to all the whole entire different experience. And we're looking at every element on the page and asking them different questions. And a lot of times they're in shock. Oh, what is this doing here? Oh, why is this not functioning properly? Oh, so it's, it's very revealing and it's really great to always have that as a consistent function in your organization. Another one, can artificial intelligence be used to improve websites and online shops? How exactly do you think <laughs> we reached that uh, milestone um, already? Well, yeah, we've been utilizing it actually in some ways. Yep. Um, like for example, for copy, it's been excellent. Okay. Um, even if, it, if you, you can't take the copy immediately from you know, chat GPT or whatever it is that you're utilizing, you can certainly get inspiration from it. So there's a lot of really good ideas there. Um, recently, for even the jobs to be done interviews, usually when we conduct those, we collect a lot of information. So we had one of our team members input that information into chat DP GPT and ask several different prompts of like, you know, what are those motivations? What are the things that have persuaded them? Who are the competitors? All this. And it was able to produce actually some really, really great insights. So I definitely see that there's a future for AI in uh, e-commerce. Of course, obviously, recommendation engines, personalization, um, but at the same time, also, just from a CRO perspective, I'm excited about what we can do to utilize it in order to create even better experiments. So I'm excited to see what happens, but I do believe there is a future there, for sure. Okay, and I have another question, just a second, because someone voted it, and it flew in my... Uh in my scroll, uh, but it was something regarding the, uh, okay, I, is there a minimum recommended period for performing the testing? So the minimum, yes, so whenever you conduct any experiment, you want to make sure that you calculate what the sample size is for that particular experiment, and again, it depends on what your primary goal is. So if I set my primary goal as the order confirmation, then I need to make sure that I calculate what that sample size is. And that'll tell you that the minimum is, for example, four days or one week or two weeks, depending on the amount of traffic and the conversion rate that you get. Now, if you do get a sample size that is less than one week, I would recommend to make sure that you at least run an experiment for one week. Um, just in order for you to make sure that you've uh, ran the experiment through an entire business cycle and you understand all the different you know, days of the week and how the visitors are performing and whatnot, and you've calculated all of that data. So at least one week, but make sure that you calculate a sample sizing. If it's longer, you want to make sure that it's, uh, uh, it's running that period of time before you actually conclude it. And don't get excited. If you see like really great results in the beginning, don't get excited. Let it run through the sample size. Excellent. And I promise you uh, one final question. Um, is there a way to measure the results, the conversion rate and so on, uh, of branding campaigns or something regarded to content marketing? You know, subjective things. Right. I mean, so we've done, you can test, for example, if you're on, for instance, Shopify. Many times we'll have clients that'll change their entire theme and then you can see whether or not that change of the theme, which usually, usually is because you have a change in branding and whatnot, what type of an impact it actually had. So you can test actually you know, one theme versus the next. So there are ways to actually measure that and test that. And I would recommend before you make a complete change, just to see what type of an impact you're going to have. Um, Server-side testing, we've also done that before in order to make sure that, again, when they're migrating to a new platform or whatever it is, that we're able to measure what type of an impact it's actually going to have on their conversion rates. Thank you so much, Ayat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Your applause, please. Thank you for joining us at GPEC Moldova. It was a pleasure having you on stage. Thank you.